So if you can't see me, I can't see you. If you can like just move a little bit because I, I do like to make some contact for emphasis. Uh, also like to see if you're sleeping. <laughs> Good evening. We have a, a quite a bit of work to cram into a day and a half, uh, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, I think I'd like to start with, um, I usually end with an exhortation, but I'd like to start with one because of our, our topic uh, today. And this was a, a song that I adapted from um, my Christian tradition. Uh, I used to love it, and it was always speaking to, in my reliance on a uh, heavenly being, that um, he was able, uh, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. But what I like about the Dharma is that I learned that I had to be responsible for my own self. I was always wondering, why well, do I always need a miracle? I went, I'm looking for a miracle. I always needed a miracle because I was always getting myself into some kind of jam. Mm-hmm. And I found out from the Dharma that I don't have to always be getting in a jam. A jam. I can learn how to handle what concerns me every day. And this uh, takes us not only towards being able to have the right response to the vicissitudes of life, whether it's praise or blame, loss or gain, pleasure or pain, fame or shame. But it also conditions me to be able to be of a presence in the world that is offering, uh, that's offering love and compassion where there is hatred. The one who can give or provide the antidote. And so sometimes um, when your, like your last nerve is being pushed or when you're like not quite sure you're going to be able to hold it together, when your skillfulness is starting to recede to the back seat, you know, then you can always remind yourself uh, of this. And so it goes something like this, and when you get the hang of it, you can, you can just uh, join in. Uh, the reason why I like to do these little ditties is because, you know, that's how, that's how uh, children learn. Right, in kindergarten, I'm not saying we kindergarten, but you know what I mean. In kindergarten, um, they, they sing that little song, they sing their ABCs, and um, it's just part of our culture. It's a way that we learn things. It's also part of most of the Western um, uh, spiritual experience that we coded something, we imprinted it on the heart um, through, through song. Uh, and so it goes something like this. I am able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. All timers. I am able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. I am able, To do much more than I could even dream, dream I'm able, I'm more than able to be just what I really want to be. So we're going to be talking about conscience. I am able, more than able to accomplish what concerns me today. I am able, I'm more than able to handle anything that comes my way. I am able, I'm more than able to be much more than I could even dream. I am able, I'm more than able to be just what I really and I'll tell you, there comes a time when you kind of need that reminder, that voice speaking back to you, that voice singing back to you, that voice reminding you of who you are, of the qualities that you possess. Sometimes the qualities are hidden behind 
uh, a cloud like the sun, but they're still there. Um, there's this practice, the yogic practice, I and mean, you, you could try this if you don't believe me, uh, but we practice uh, piercing the cloud. And so uh, we go out on a, on a, a day when, you know, it's a, like clouds are passing through, like, like just the, um, but it's a sunny day, not a, not a gray overcast day, it's a sunny day. And then there's a cloud, and we're just looking at the cloud, and we just keep looking at the cloud. But not at the cloud, we're looking at the sky behind the cloud. And before you know it, it like just parts open, just like it, don't, don't believe me, try it. So don't think, don't believe anything. <laughs> don't believe everything <laughs> that you pick up from your external sense gates, okay? They come into those sense gates. Sometimes what you think you heard, that wasn't actually what you heard. Sometimes you, what you saw wasn't actually what was happening. You know, you just thought you saw that. And so he tells us that, that you know, we have to use these faculties and these gates to make a connection with this outer world, what we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, and think. He says, but don't give it more uh, uh, presence and more quality than it needs. And part of our coming together is to begin to relax and to set aside these faculties because we have other faculties, but they only get activated in certain circumstances. That there's a, something, a state of mind that has to be attained before these other um, uh, uh, qualities of being, before these uh, other faculties uh, uh, um, come into, uh, shift into operation or until we can recognize that they're there and they're, and they're operating. So when he talks about, uh, people and talks about ordinary, run-of-the-mill, untaught, untrained people, you know, and I mean, like, I was one of those, you know, and, but my feelings were hurt. I mean, I came because I did not want to be ordinary. I did want to be taught. I did not want to be run-of-the-mill, and I wanted to possess, um, the sublime qualities of those that I admired. You know, I was talking last night. Everybody like admires a, a, a model, but nobody wants to. Nobody wants to be one. You know, <laughs> uh, we like just like talk about how great they are, how great they are. Uh, but there is something that we come to know in our practice through the mastery that is available um, to us, and that mastery is where our true joy comes from, it's where our true confidence comes from. I want to read a, a statement from the Dalai Lama. <clears throat> and the question was asked to him, isn't it necessary, uh, isn't it also necessary to practice meditation to obtain mental peace? And the Dalai Lama said, my experience is that it is obtained mainly through reasoning. Meditation does not help much. The main cure is to realize how harmful, how negative anger or fear or whatever is. And once you realize this very clearly, very convincingly, how negative it is, that realization itself has the power to reduce anger. Now, as soon as I started reading, you know, if I had stopped at the first sentence, I like, I, I, I beg to disagree agree with you, you know, when he said, my experience is that uh, mental peace is obtained mainly through reasoning. Meditation does not help much. So that's because I'm like, maybe a meditation junkie, I like it, you know, because I like it, it helps, you know. Um, but I understand his point about reasoning. I mean, that's the, 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 the Buddha placed it how to list. He, 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 he invited us to investigate and to encourage, to use reasoning. But then he said, you know, you're not going to be able to get this by mere reasoning alone. So there, it's like if I want to bake a cake, i got to have more than just flour. You know, I have to have more than just flour and sugar. I have to have, well, whatever it takes to make cakes. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know it takes more than flour and sugar. I know that because I had a bakery, you know, uh, when I had our program for our own shoes. And one time, uh, the, the 
the real baker didn't show up, but we still had to bake that bread and get it out to the stores. And so uh, the kids were looking at me, and I was looking at them. We were trying to figure out what's going to happen here today. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, I mean, you can't just call the grocery chain and say, you know, like the baker didn't show up. And so I said, oh, oh, okay, so I can do it. Pull out the instructions, and they got the instructions, and I'm like, red, we got, 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 got. So I got, and so I just uh, had to, I mean, we have big vats, 120 quarts, I mean, so if you make a mistake, it's not a little mistake, it's a huge mistake. And so we're uh, like just mixing everything in uh, according to the ingredient list, and then when I get to the ingredient list, I get to the instructions. Now I'm thinking, how difficult it is, is it, you know, you need sugar, you need butter, you need, you know, and, and I put all of that in there. Why do I need instructions on how to pour things in? You know, so I didn't pay any attention to them. I just made sure I got the ingredients right. That's the thing, right? What happened is, I didn't know, I didn't know that, um, what do you, what do you call that stuff that makes the stuff rise? Yeah, yeah, that's. I didn't know that the yeast had to be put in water that was, I think it was 110 degrees and set aside for three minutes until it does something so that it's ready to go in into the batch. So I, I just threw the dry yeast in. And now the, the bread wasn't rising, you know. I mean, it was like a lot of bread, 120 loaves. And so... I was thinking, well, they should have put that up at the top. <laughs> um, anyway, so what I did was I made more yeast, and I put this in all the water, and I put that yeast, and I put that in, and so that kind of heat kind of made the other yeast also activate. <laughs> so we had about 60 additional loaves. <laughs> um, but... You know, the point that I'm trying to make is it's not just having the instructions, you know. It's not just knowing the ingredients, you know. But there is a whole process and a whole attentiveness that needs to be um, uh, invited to our practice. And so the Buddha talks about this in one sutta and he talks about that in another because at one time, this mind was in front of him, and he spoke to that one according to what they needed to hear. And another time, this one. Now it's filtered down to us into chapters and verses and books, but it wasn't like that when it was delivered. It was a mind, wrapping mind, and speaking into the, And then we look at it and say, oh, yeah, that could go for me, too. I need that. I need that bit of information. And so keep that in mind when we're studying, even when we're doing... A, a systematic study. Some of the Buddhist disciples only saw him one time. They they may have gotten a, a, a five minute, may have had a five minute conversation that had to last them a lifetime. You know. Now, how's that going to work for you? I mean, you you have to really, you have to be able to follow enough of the instruction until it points you to your own inner brightness, to your mm. own luminosity, to your own Buddha nature. The Buddha said, I wouldn't even bother with you all about this if you didn't have that Buddha nature under there somewhere. He said, I, I say to you because the same said, otherwise there'd be no way for you to get this if you didn't possess the capacity, if the Buddha nature wasn't there. So if you could think um, in terms of us peeling away layers, like, like the uh, layers of an onion, it's something like that more than something like this, screwing off and dumping something into your head. You, you, you got it with me? So here's the first thing. That's why I sing that song, that I'm able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. I say that to myself when I'm not feeling able to accomplish. You know, I arouse uh, my courage. I arouse um, my, my, my faith in the uh, awakened quality of the mind that is there resident somewhere. Sometimes I can't find it, but um, <laughs> I, this, I believe that it's there. The reason I believe that it's there is because sometimes, oh, you know, something comes to you. Nobody told you. It says, hmm, it, the thought came to me. I would read what the Buddha said, you know, such and such. 
And it occurred to me, I'm like, yeah, who would like me to? It occurred to me. <laughs> it, it occurred to me. Like, this, this, where did it come from? It occurred to me. It, it, um, and so before things that I may have ascribed to some other, some other power, because I didn't know how it came about, you know? I felt uh, like some information, some enablement rising up, you know, and we had a language for it. You know, like, out of our bellies flow rivers of living water that empowered me to do. But I'm like, but, but by what means does this really happen? So the Buddha helped me to understand by what means this happened. He helped me to understand that, that Panyawati is like the wave where there is really just the ocean, and when that wave top falls back down, when it's no longer uh, there because of the conditions that bring about this particular life, like the motion of the ocean, the gravity, the wind that causes this bit of water to peak, you know, to know that I am the ocean. So we might think we, we're like sitting here, or I think I'm sitting here in this pillow, but actually I'm everywhere. And so, and so I do, but not the little Panyawadi, not the egocentric Panyawadi, not the one who's so aware of this little self. And so I want to encourage you to have a faster vision over the next couple of days of who and what you really are mm -hmm. so that you can be an effectual, fervent presence uh, in the world. Now, our talk this weekend is going to be, you know, I was, I was a Baptist preacher, so it was all night, it was all right, so that's why I have to have, I have, to have a clock. Uh, but that's true. That's the first thing I learned being Buddhist, you know, because, uh, I mean, I mean, I just have to say it. I've had a sangha now for uh, 16 years, and, and my sangha's still all white. And uh, and I came from a space where I we you know like don't wear watches and didn't pay that much attention to time, you know um, we just enjoyed ourselves until we fell out of exhaustion, you know like o overly uh, uh, so happy and and dancing and singing and praise and worship until we like just fell out. and then when it was over we we go home. Um, but uh, they let me know right away. Uh, no, we stay on time. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> it's something like that. So I'm, I'm trying to respect respect that for you, you know, so you can keep happy minds. <laughs> so so we're going to be talking uh, about uh, taking our CC. You know, our CCs is the combination of, of conscience uh, and compassion. And we're always saying, particularly in a time like this, how we need to arouse compassion for the world. And we're trying to do all of these things to arouse compassion. You know, I looked at this, but actually, time doesn't, um, I don't really relate to it. Can you tell me <laughs> what time I need to? <laughs> I mean, <what> <laughs> Uh, I mean, they're just numbers. So, <laughs> we, we, we need to go to bed at 10.30. Okay, okay got it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I tell you, being a monk is really, really uh, <laughs> fun. Called the analyzers, which they were, you know, but they were also called the happy ones, you know, because these things that that you know uh, irritate us and that tick us off, and I mean, th these things that don't matter at all, and the things that that we invest our time in that take away the time that we can really invest in in uh, waking up, you know, and so uh, yeah. So I wanted to talk about conscience and compassion, you know, 
And that uh, I agree with the Dalai Lama. There is something there about the learning and reflecting and learning again and reflecting and learning again. But there is that combination of the meditation practice, the meditative attainment that's needed simply because we get things and we can utilize things only according to uh, the mental state we're in at that time. So if I'm not in a good frame of mind, I'm not in a, a good state of mind, I'm not in a healthy state, then when good information comes, I can't make as much use, you know, because I'm groveling or rolling around in the basement, or I'm flagellating myself, or I'm feeling, oh, poor me, or I'm like hating on you, or whatever it is, you know, so I'm not going to be able to use that. The information can be good, wonderful, perfect, but it's not going to do me much good because the state of mind is at a low level. If it's at a midland level, then I'm able to uh, to utilize the information in a more powerful way. And if I have a high state of mind, a pure state of mind, I'm able to absolutely assimilate it and become transformed by it. You know, that unification of mind where I become that thing, I become that quality. And so uh, a lot of this is about uh, and has been instructional for me in removing the personality. I no longer need a being to look up to, but there's a quality of being that I worship, honestly. A quality of being that I aspire to, a quality of being. And when I enter into that space, I become not this being, but I become that pure, raw quality. And that's um, that's the product or the fruit of good practice. So um, I have, I had, it's coming back, I lost it a bit, but I had a photographic mem memory. I was going to be a, a musician, concert pianist. And uh, <clears throat> I started taking karate. That's why I was making that joke about Bruce Lee last night. I, mean, I know you didn't get it. It was a personal joke, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was talking about something really serious, really dumb, and then I said something about Bruce Lee. And he was sitting there like this, and he said, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, that's all right. He'll get to know me soon. Um, and so um, I never really uh, studied. I, I said, like, just look at, you know, look at the pages and look at the pages. And then I had them recorded. And so I could, like, goof off or do anything because I could be studying while I was out playing or whatever because I could, like, just pull the pages up, you know, in front of me, something like that. And um, and I, I had a, uh, an accident, uh, I guess, about a, a little over a year ago. And I, I fell and I had a, a bad concussion. And uh, I lost my photographic memory. And, it, you know, so now I'm like, oh, man, I'm like the rest of the world. Now I have to study. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very difficult when you're, when you're almost 70 to, um, to get into a new groove with this, you know. So um, I always travel with my, my books because... I know, I know, if any of you come from the uh, Tibetan tradition and the great respect for your books, that you keep them like this. My great respect is when the book is all tattered and worn out. That's, that's, that's my respect for the book. So I have comments in my books about, you know, when I encountered something. And I never let anybody see my books because... They'll, I'll, they'll have something here, and I'll say, that's not true. And else, and I'm, I tried that, that didn't work. <laughs> and I'll look. But the thing is, and so the pages, you know, the binding has worn out over the years, and the pages, I have to hold the book gently, because if I drop the book, it's all over. And, um, and then later I look and I cross that out, and say, oh, you know, uh, or I write some like little insight that I, you know, that something that came to me. You know, like three years I've been chewing on this. Or maybe I read it once and I like absolutely dismissed it. 
you know, didn't even come back, not only to that, uh, to that uh, section, I didn't even come back to, to that suitor, you know. Um, and uh, three years later, I got to get to it. Girl, I'm, I must have been blind and I see this, you know. How could I not get this? How, how could this not make sense to me? You know? So I say to you, you know, you don't have to like uh, press so hard mm. to enter into the understanding of something. He's talking about things that are lofty and sublime. I know we think we're smart, but <laughs> you know, this is not ordinary wisdom until it is ordinary wisdom. And so, just let it gradually, uh, like a, a a sponge, soaking in. Uh, it's actually a resonance to tell you. You know, and and it's striking your bell, you know, and pretty soon over time, if we're diligent, if we respect and if we honor it, then it will strike the sound, you know, of the unobstructed mind. And you will hear that sound inside. It's not to be found out here. It's not even to be found in the book. It, that's just pointing to something but it's through direct experience alone. So in here, and I'm wrapping up now, no worries. So in here, um, there's a sutta, and the Buddha talks about how he takes, you know, he takes his disciples from the city. You know, he takes them away from the city sounds, the city sights, the city smells, and he takes them to the forest. And then, he says that after a while, they get acclimated to the sounds, the sights, and the smells of the forest. You know, it's, it's oh, I know it's called the, uh, the Sutta on Voidness. So he says, so this place is void, the forest, void of what? It's void of the sounds and the smells and the sights of the city. That's what it's void of. Don't have to come to it. I mean, he made it plain. It was not like this woo, woo, everything like just, you know, dissolved into emptiness. He said it's void of the sounds, the sights, the smells of the city. And he said, but then after a while, I take them to the earth. Because we become acclimated to the sounds and the sights and the smells of the forest. We, and we like that. Oh, I just want to be in the trees and the smell of flowers and the you know, so it has its own outer distraction. So you see what he's actually doing is um, uh, it's uh, cutting away the external distractions so that we can really go in, really go in deep. Now, my master, one of my masters, she was old school. I'm old school, but she was old, old school. And um, the way we had to meditate when we first went to her, was uh, to even have an opportunity to be considered, we had to sit for 30 minutes. That's how we started, 30 minutes. And I tell you, 30 minutes might as well be 300 hours. If, you know, like, if, if you don't know what this is and your mind is running all, all over the place. But if we could sit for 30 days, for 30 minutes straight, if, if we messed it up, um, just going by the outside, we messed it up, we have to start all over again. And then, once she accepted us, we had to sit for, we started at two hours a day, and then we increased it up to eight, eight hours a day. And, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so, she would have us sit, and we had, because we were in the city, and we had <laughs> and and we had like a, a scarf sort of over our eyes. Now, we were doing a particular type of meditation on the um, light and sound. Okay. And um, and when you reach a certain thank you, you got it. When you reach a certain um, degree of concentration on the light, the light manifested. So we would wear this 
you know, kerchief or whatever or off. So that if the light did manifest, we knew it really was the light. It wasn't a light of a car passing. You know, it was like that. So if, if, this, if there was light, it was really light because we had this, this like, kind of light black thing over our face. And so um, then uh, we also had our thumbs in our ears because we were listening for the sound of the spheres, the celestial sound the planetary sound. And um, so we had our fingers in our ears, so if we heard a sound, you know, we were more sure that it wasn't an outer sound. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this. I'm just simply sharing an experience that I've been able to use to deepen my practice. Um, and uh, so if you just for a minute, take your thumbs and put them in your ears and just count to 10, a hold for 10 seconds um, and then and close your eyes Sorry, you can stop now. <laughs> uh, uh, so, if you can imagine meditating like that for two hours, <clears throat> you find all kinds of creative ways <laughs> to do it. You find all kinds of creative ways <laughs> <laughs> to hold it in there. But the thing is, where are you, in which condition? Were you more connected to the outer world, like this, or when it was like this? Was there this closing in, this gathering in, a sense of stillness, of almost a disquieting kind of stillness? Because we're not used to that kind of, 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 of softening of sound. Didn't it almost immediately turn you, turn you inward? And so, for that reason, when I left her, that I came up to the 20, oh, that's another one. What happened to the other one? Okay, just pretend I opened these. <laughs> it came up to the 21st century, and I got earplugs. And I'm going to tell you, I have some really good ones at, at, at home. I have the, the totally silent, uh, uh, what do you call these, Head, headphones. Maybe. Uh, and and I, I just love it. I tell you, I descend in 30 seconds to an extremely, extremely deep place. And once that happens, just before that whole sense of Paniwadi completely dissolves, I just take them off because I'm in the zone now. I'm in the zone. I just take them off and I, like, and I go through that veil, into that spacious dimension. Um, and I stay there until I come out. I usually like set a time. You know, I'm going to stay half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever. And I usually come out like a minute before, maybe two minutes before, because there's a part of us that never sleeps or slumbers. There's a part of mine always, always awake. He knows what time it is. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I do this Mostly in the middle of the night. Okay, I know we're in retreat. Don't be disturbing anybody. But when you get back home at night when the, uh, the uh, energy of people's minds are settled because they're asleep, you know, when the uh, vibration is smoother, <coughs> the atmosphere is clear, then we can sit in that kind of silence and influx really help until you find out where that is. But the thing is, once you find out where that silence is, and you go there a few times, then you know, and you can go, you can go right to it. It's just like a, it's just like you just shut off from, mm -hmm. from out here. And this is useful for certain types of practices. And that's why he took us away from these 
sights and sounds and smells and, and tastes that we're so familiar with. And so when we're even having our meals over the weekend, you know, it's not so much for for um, the pleasing, you know, we like our stuff to look colorful, uh, we like it to taste yummy, uh, but developing uh, this uh, renunciation, you know, is more than uh, a switch that we turn off and on. It becomes a way of life that we become acclimated that these things are more uh, precious to us than other things. And we become uh, satisfied. You know, we have fewness of wishes. And we start then uh, being a part of the, you know, the solutions that we need in this world. You know, everybody wants everybody else to have less or to be satisfied with less. That does not has not anything to do with me personally. You know, but you need to cut back. And so uh, it's in this way that we begin to cut back, you know, on our own uh, excesses. We begin to take our own sting of, of anger uh, out of the world because I'm running late for work or because I even have to go to work, you know. Uh, and... and uh, and before we know it, the world shifts because it shifts one person at a time. And every time I abandon, renounce some unwholesome state of being, you know, there is the uh, uh, more light becomes apparent in the world. So we're going to be talking. Uh, our brooch. Uh, the Six Transcendences is what we're going to be studying. It's a teaching from Lamb Realm, the stages of the path. And we're going to be talking about the six uh, qualities that transcend both the world and Nibbana. And after we talk about one topic, then we're going to stop and meditate right there, stopping and reflecting right there. So we're going to have to have some guidelines on how to quickly get into that still space. And that's why I was just sharing, you know, some ideas. It's like, like the quick method. Uh, uh, how to get into that still space because it takes the settling down, the suppression of the hindrances, you know. Temporary, yes. But when you keep touching the, even that temporary state, and find out how sublime it is. It gives you the uh, the courage, and it allows the efforting to uproot, to permanently uproot it in in your waking, walking, daily interacting, interacting world. Okay, I did pretty good. Um, one minute, you see that? Okay. Uh, so we're gonna uh, go ahead and meditate in your own way uh, for the next. I think 25, we have to go to bed at 10.30, 9.20, I mean 10.20. Uh, so if you want to use it, this is a vibrating camera.